welcome everybody uh, to our event, uh, which we're entitling Homelessness Counts. I'm Cheryl Forchuk, so I'm the lead researcher on this project. And uh, I'll be going over the agenda and a few other items. Uh, Courtney, if you could leave that first slide on. Uh, but the first slide, Courtney, thank you. Um, so I'll be going over the agenda and some of the other items shortly, uh, but what I wanted to f first do is talk a little bit about why uh, we're doing what, what we're doing. And, and uh, as well, in, in terms of introducing myself, in terms of my role, uh, I am with the Lawson Health Research Institute, which is the research arm of the London, Ontario hospitals. Uh, this event is also being broadcast uh, live over the Lawson website on Facebook. And for those of you, if you want to advise people after, you could have them go back to that site. It, it will be taped and available after as well. Uh, my other roles is I am a research chair at Parkwood Institute Research, uh, which is part of St. Joseph's Healthcare in uh, London and with the School of of nursing and department of psychiatry at Western University. So why, wh what is this about? Wh what do we mean homelessness counts? And I just wanted to situate this at the beginning. And I know when we go through our speakers, um, Craig Cooper is gonna land back on that. But I, I have done research in relation to homelessness, uh, let's just say for more than a couple of decades at this point. And one of our biggest struggles in doing research in this area, as well as many people doing practice in this area, is we don't actually know how many people are homeless. We, we certainly don't know in the country uh, of Canada how many people are homeless. Uh, we don't know often, even within smaller regions, we, we do the best we can with the evidence that we have, but, but we know it's incomplete. Why does that matter? Uh, often um, accessing resources, planning for the needs of specific people can be very difficult if you don't know uh, what's actually uh, going on. You can't have um, some of our work, for example, on preventing discharge from hospital to homelessness. When we started that work, the only li literature uh, that we could find that that was actually a myth, it didn't happen. And it was by going and getting data showing how often did it happen how, by uh, shelter data, by hospital data, uh, that we could actually come up with interventions. Uh, similarly, if we want something specific to youth or to veterans, we, we have to know that those populations exist. Uh, so we really need better ways of counting homelessness so that we can provide better services and we can evaluate the, whether the services actually prevent homelessness, help people out of homelessness with actual numbers. Uh, so going to the next slide with the agenda, we're going to have a number of greetings at the beginning. Uh, I, uh, as I say, I, I am welcoming everybody and par part of that welcome I should add as well is we do have people who've registered today from coast to coast to coast uh, in Canada and we're very happy uh, to have all of your participation today. It's so important and we're glad so many people are interested in the topic. We also have a number from the US, uh, from Europe, from Africa. Uh, and I'm not sure where else at this point, but we're all glad that you are with us today, that you may have interesting perspectives and questions that you will be answering, uh, and so welcome. Uh, we'll be shortly going to the land acknowledgement, uh, French greeting, um, and then we'll be talking into more the nitty gritty of our project and some of our initial findings. Um, Richard Booth uh, is going to be talking about uh, some of the what some of the work we're planning on in terms of um, having an algorithm to determine uh, numbers of homelessness. Uh, Craig Cooper uh, from the City of London will be giving a perspective as to why data is important. 
Um, thank you so much, Craig, for um, participating in the project as well as today, because at the end of the day, it has to make a difference to practice and people, uh, people in practice. There will be an opportunity for a question period. In the meantime, you will notice at the bottom uh, there is a question and answer. Uh, so you could be jotting things down at any point. Uh, we may not get to that until we get to the question period, but it, it, um, it, it will give a, a chance for us to see that. And we'll be talking a little bit more about how those questions will be handled uh, later, and then we'll be done. So on to Courtney, who is uh, one of the research staff uh, in my lab, who uh, will be giving the land acknowledgement, Courtney. Thank you, Cheryl. So Lawson Health Research Institute and our partners are situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Wendat, and Attawandaran peoples who have long-standing relationships to the land and region of Southwestern Ontario and the City of London. The local First Nations communities of this area include Chippewa of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Munsee Delaware Nation. In this region, there are 11 First Nation communities and a growing Indigenous urban population. We acknowledge both the historical and ongoing injustices faced by Indigenous peoples in Canada and commit to actively listening to, learning from, and building relationships with our Indigenous allies. We value the significant historical and contemporary contributions of local and regional First Nations and all of the original peoples of Turtle Island, North America. Thank you. And Harry Kim uh, will give our greeting in, uh, in French. Uh, merci. Bonjour tout le monde. Merci d'être venu aujourd'hui. Uh, bienvenue au lancement de notre projet d'itinérance du compte. Uh, je m'appelle Larry, je suis un des étudiants qui travaille avec Dr. Fortchuk et je vais être ici en tant que modérateur en français. Uh, le restant de la présentation va être en anglais, donc uh, si vous, vous êtes plus confortable à envoyer vos questions en français, je peux les traduire pour les autres présentateurs. Et aussi, si vous voulez une copie du résumé du projet en français, euh, vous pouvez euh, donner un message dans le chat et je vais mettre mon courriel. Euh, mon courriel va aussi être affiché à la fin de la présentation, si vous voulez une copie. Merci. So, first off, uh, or, or maybe this is third or fourth off, <laughs> we'll, we want to thank our sponsor uh, for this research. And this would not have been possible without um, the sponsorship of the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, and of course, the uh, views expressed are our own, not, not the Public Health Agency of Canada, but we certainly uh, thank them. This, this is work, um, and I'm sure Richard would agree, we've, we've been wanting to do this work for a long time, uh, so very appreciative of the, uh, this opportunity. Next. Uh, Courtney, are you okay to move to the next slide? Okay, I think Courtney's slide is uh, freezing a bit. Uh, but I will move to the content of what is on the next slide and um, Courtney uh, will advance the slide shortly. Uh, so as mentioned, uh, this is something we've been wanting to do for a time uh, for those reasons uh, that I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and so one of the things we did in one of our earlier projects, in fact, was the one we talked about preventing discharge to homelessness, we put in that for funds uh, to work with some of the ICES, uh, the ISIS database, which is a, a provincial database in Ontario that deals with health data, uh, to come up with an algorithm uh, within the health data to see how, how can we um, 
identify within health data who's homeless and who's not homeless. Uh, when the slide comes back up, uh, you'll see some of the uh, publications that have come out of that. And essentially what we found, oh, sorry, I, I go back one, actually, you know what, um, go to the slide ahead and then we'll go back because I was imagining the wrong slides. I'll, I'll just do this and I'll go back to the team. Uh, so what, what we um, found is that actually the algorithm worked extremely well for people who had accessed the healthcare system. If within this algorithm, it, uh, it indicated people were homeless, they were generally homeless. The problem with it when we compared it to our research samples is that not everybody who is homeless accesses the healthcare system. Uh, so that's clearly a limitation that, that uh, Richard's gonna be talking about how we're building on this early success um, to, uh, to improve this and how we think that by using existing data, we, we may be able to answer some of the questions um, in a very efficient way. Uh, that we want. And just as an, so you'll see the first article down there, uh, sorry, um, uh, stay on that slide, um, Courtney, and then we're gonna go backwards a slide when I finish this slide. Uh, so you will see the, the first pa paper there, Lucy Richards uh, from ICS is the first author. So that's uh, if people are interested in finding um, that particular one. But just as an example, you say, okay, well, that's a huge limitation uh, that people have to access the healthcare system in order to use this algorithm. But in fact, even having that kind of algorithm can be very helpful uh, because we were actually able to use this in a very rapid report. One of the fastest papers I can, I can tell you we ever got out like in about two weeks, I think. Uh, and again, thank you to, for Lucy as uh, first author on that and uh, basically looked at what was going on with people who were homeless and COVID. Uh, and of course, people with COVID had access to the healthcare system, so they were in there. And um, some of those results around testing and infection of complications uh, was then able to be used for why we need to prioritize vaccinations, for example, for people who are homeless. Now, without this kind of algorithm, we, we could not have had that kind of evidence. So just go backwards one so I can introduce the team. Yep, uh, just, I'm just gonna have to stop share for one second. Cheryl, I put it up on my screen. I apologize for that. I'll be just throwing it back up in one second here. Okay, thank you. Okay, so do we still not have, um, is Courtney still missing? Okay, so we'll have you do. Okay, so we're gonna just go to the slide to introduce the team. Sorry, we lost you, Courtney. It's one of the wonders of technology is that uh, these things do happen. Don't worry about it. Just get to the slide that shows the, um, the team. Yes, yeah, so just wanted to thank all the team. Uh, Richard Booth and I are the co-principal investigators on this. Uh, we're both affiliated with both laws, which I mentioned is the research arm of the London Hospitals as well as Western University. And we do have a number of other uh, partners. I'm sure a lot of the people on the call will recognize pe uh, people. Uh, Salima from IC. Yes, we, uh, Dan, in terms of computer scientists who has worked with artificial intelligence. Uh, we've got some very uh, well-known people in the field of homelessness, uh, such as Stephen Huang and Stephen Gates, uh, Jen, um, uh, Jennifer Rayner in terms of the Alliance for he Healthier Communities and, and Dr. Chris Ma uh, Mackey uh, from Public Health locally, and Craig Cooper, who you will be hearing a uh, from shortly uh, from the city of London. Uh, Sarah is the research coordinator. Uh, so again, if there's uh, information you want, uh, uh, you know, or a contact, you can also directly contact um, Sarah. So we'll continue and we'll go on to the next one. Uh, so again, our general goal is to improve this algorithm we already have, try to figure out who, how many people are homeless in Canada, but, uh, but again, there's a wider purpose. It's just not for intellectual curiosity. It's so that we can get people help uh, so that we know that the, uh, we can identify some of these unmet needs. Uh, and actually the, the picture of um, 
that you see in the background uh, represents one of our groups of hidden homeless often is people who are uh, living in the rough. And it's often one of the groups that are missed by many of our traditional means of counting people who are homeless. Uh, they, they often become invisible and it, it's not random. We find specific subgroups uh, tend to be more likely to be living in the rough. During COVID, this has increased tremendously. Uh, but for example, in our previous work with homeless veterans, as one example, we found they very often were living in the rough. And that's one of the reasons we actually had this, this uh, photograph uh, initially, which uh, and, and the photograph is Justin uh, Languil that's worked with us in some of our projects. Next slide. So what we're planning on doing, how, how are we going to get there? Um, so what we hope to do is go to uh, at least 12 communities across Canada uh, we, uh, and interview um, people in these communities. To start with focus groups uh, where we talk to people providing services uh, to, the home, to the homeless population within their community to understand what is the nature of homelessness in that community? How, how do they collect data uh, in their community, which would tell us where people might end up with services to they access? Uh, and then um, who, within those subgroups, who might end up uh, hidden? Uh, and then these communities help us find individuals who have experienced homeless, and we talk to, the, to them about their, um, their perception is what services they access, because again, the services will also tell us um, where they may show up in data and, and talk to them. So this year, we went, uh, and we'll be talking about it, we went to the Ontario communities first because we want to first refine the Ontario algorithm we already have. And then you'll see in the subsequent years, we're going to be um, broadening and working on that further. So further refine, refining, uh, seeing um, how we can expand the existing algorithm um, uh, generating this risk and burden modeling, bringing in the machine learning. And again, Rich is going to be talking way more about this. Uh, and then begin a prototype development. What, what, what we'll be doing as we go through these phases, though, is before we finish, we're going to go back to the, to the communities that we engage initially uh, to share the opportunities uh, for knowledge translation and what we've learned. But the other really important thing with going back to those communities a second time is it's kind of a reality check. So they can say, okay, you know what? You're still missing whatever that we may still be missing. Uh, so it gives us an opportunity um, to check back in with those communities. This, this year, as you can imagine, um, much of this data collection was virtual. We certainly hope uh, by the end of the four year project, we're actually technically in year two now, uh, that we will be able to go there in person, maybe even some of the ones this fiscal year uh, will go to in person, but, but we think it's really important uh, to circle back uh, to the community. So next slide. Uh, so as mentioned, we have already gone uh, to five communities and I have to absolutely thank tremendously um, our community part, uh, partners, uh, we could not, there's no way that we could have done this without their support. Uh, because we were not notified of funding until October, we were well into uh, this fiscal, the last fiscal year. Uh, we still had to get ethics approval, which did not come through to January. Uh, and anybody in Ontario knows most of our municipalities, their fiscal year ends March 31st. So in February and March, uh, this is a huge inconvenience uh, for people to say, hey, we want to do focus groups and help you find these people. And meanwhile, you may be in lockdown uh, due to the pandemic right now. Our goal was to get 60 to 70 uh, participants. And as you can see, we exceeded that. And the reason we exceeded that was uh, because of the tremendous engagement uh, of these communities. So uh, as I said, uh, this was not a small ask and, and we thank you all. Uh, and it's gonna be tremendously important. Uh, 
Uh, so this is just a snapshot of who we found uh, in the individual interviews and who we inter interviewed. Now, this is not necessarily a representation of all the homeless within the people within these communities, because we specifically asked, as I said, who might be invisible and made sure um, and then asked us, you know, so for example, um, living in the rough uh, was a common concern that people had, um, pe uh, people who were indigenous, there was concerns could could be missed. Uh, so so when they helped us find people, they, uh, they were very attentive to finding um, people that might be missed within the system. Uh, and you just see some examples. This is a very superficial cut, but the, the interaction uh, with the judicial system, I think is significant uh, in terms of 56 of the 82s. And some of these interactions as people who work in the field know is simply because a person is homeless that often creates situations of where they end up with, with justice system. Uh, involvement. So, so, mentioned Health Agency of Canada. When we went to, to the public health and saying this is a public health issue, a part of our argument really was the multiple um, illnesses, chronic illnesses that people who are uh, homeless often have, uh, you will see in many cases, this adds up to more than 100. So for example, in terms of the mental health diagnosis, the, uh, this is more than 100% when, when you think of uh, the numbers, which indicates that many people had more, uh, and indeed 42 people had more than one psychiatric diagnosis. There was only 14 uh, that did not report any. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have any mental health problems. Uh, what that means is they have not sought medical help and have an actual diagnosis. Um, it's, it's similarly, for physical illness, you can see that 22 uh, had multiple physical diagnoses uh, compared to none, 33, uh, which is a pretty uh, um, small number. Uh, and and you frequently reported uh, arthritis, heart conditions, blood pressure, etc. Um, okay. In terms of housing status, uh, most of the people were currently housing. We did have a few that have been very recently housed, um, uh, and a lot of that because uh, because of the pandemic situation. Uh, we again we. Given the concerns in the communities about um, missing people who were in the rough, uh, sleeping rough, we uh, wanted to make sure we had a lot of interviews with that population to understand what kinds of services, et cetera, they, they access. So again, don't take this as um, to understand that you know, 36 and uh, us really working on finding people uh, that might otherwise be missed. Uh, certainly emergency shelters, et cetera, you can see is our next highest group, which is which is a very common uh, place. And you can see the other types of um, accommodation. Uh, so when we talk to the people who provide services uh, to people who are homeless, we ask them about what kinds of data do they use? Uh, and you can see there was a wide range uh, of data, which is going to inform some of our uh, next steps. But interesting, the most common method that people reported was keeping some form of internal spreadsheet that was created by individual agencies. Uh, so this is also uh, important to understand in terms of some of the issues around data that people face. And what do pe did people say were some of the biggest problems they had? And again, I'm just giving highlights from these many focus groups. Uh, it, it, the fact that they don't have the data, the data is not integrated. Uh, it doesn't take to account, to, into account cultural sensitivities and essentially a lot of trust issues uh, around 
data sharing uh, are, are not always accommodated. Uh, defined as homeless uh, was common across all our sites. And um, that in most of our communities, the, this idea of having an easily accessible centralized source uh, and uh, even where some things were available, uh, many of the people in practice said that they lacked the technical skills uh, to actually operate some of the, the databases that were available. Um, these are just examples from across the communities who people described as being potentially homeless. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of surprises here, but, uh, it, uh, but it is important to recognize. And so these are some of the groups we're going to be making a point of making sure we do include. Uh, and I'm going to pass on now to, uh, to uh, Dr. Richard Booth, uh, who is with the author Labatt Family School of Nursing at Western and also uh, a Lawson scientist. Thank you, Richard. That's great. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Uh, Courtney, if you move to the next slide, that'd be fantastic. So uh, I'm going to walk through the algorithm. We mentioned it in the past a few times. I'm going to try to take it a, at a high level and describe the background to this. But this project has kind of been in the work between Cheryl, myself, and a few others for about six or seven years at this point. Now, when we look at data that's derived from healthcare interaction, so anytime you use an OHIP card for healthcare interaction, uh, an organization called ICES uh, in the center here gets that data. So anytime you pretty much do anything in the healthcare system, um, various types of admission, discharge, treatments, diagnosis, and even things like your postal code get sent to this organization, which from a prescribed entity perspective, which means they sit within privacy law in Ontario, they're allowed to collect that information and do research with it. So we teamed with them a few years ago to really start building this algorithm. And by algorithm, I mean a computer software that predicts something. And we really wanted to see if we could predict cases of individuals who are homeless. So I won't get into the specifics of the algorithm, but after a lot of hard work and, and you know a lot of teamwork between uh, individuals at Lost and Western, St. Mike's and U of T, and also very much ICS Western, we came up with a prediction model of this algorithm that when we put it through information at ISIS, it gives, or ICS rather, it gives us an insight on cases or individuals who are homeless. So the paper citations there on the bottom left, if you want to like to have a look at it, it's open access, you can have a uh, go. Uh, Courtney, you can push the, the four button four more times and nice little icons pop up here. Now, the major issue with this algorithm, and it's not so much of an issue, it's just the way it was built because of the, the type of data we're using, is it only is pulled from healthcare data. You need to go to a healthcare agency that is paid for by OHIP to show up in these records. And as Cheryl has mentioned up to this point, there's a lot of hiddenness in, 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 in people experiencing homelessness. So we were only really able to find people who are homeless if they touched the formal healthcare system. And you can see that being a, a major limitation of the algorithm. It's, you know, it's, this is a stepwise thing. So it's something that we need to build on. And this is where this project really comes into. We know there's housing data that's not captured in the healthcare records. We know that there's shelter data, especially that's not captured in healthcare. We know that there's things around money that we can't we can't get, but are probably predictive of whether someone will remain homeless or or not. And then there's other types of data that Cheryl mentioned, like the spreadsheet that sits on some agency's computer, which is super valuable for predicting people who might be homeless or might become homeless, but we don't have access to it right now. And that is in some respects, the major thesis of this latter part of the project is to create a better algorithm to predict cases of individuals homeless through data. Um, because right now, the current ways we have it means that someone needs to go to the healthcare system before we can actually see them in a, in a kind of grand way. Uh, Lisa, uh, Courtney, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So what we would like to do in the coming years of this project is to take the algorithm that we've developed already and then do some really fancy statistical things with it using artificial intelligence and machine learning. For those who aren't familiar with those two terms, really what it means is we're going to take the algorithm, which is kind of like it's written down. It's just, it's just a logic chain of A plus B equals C sort of thing. And what artificial intelligence machine learning lets us do is it lets us ask those questions millions of times in every which way possible. Now, I've spent about two months looking at data structures for this project and a related project. And I have honestly come to the conclusion that I have run out of brain power to actually come up with different questions to ask of it. Because my cognition as a human is limited. I have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of data points that could be potentially used to predict individuals who are experiencing homelessness. 
But as a human, I can't ask all those questions, nor could I ever run them. That's where machine learning and artificial intelligence comes in. So in the latter part of this project, years three and years four, we're going to take the algorithm that we have already, and then we're going to start to add different types of data to it. That spreadsheet that Cheryl mentioned, we want to add that data back into it. You know, the, the housing data that we didn't have before because it wasn't a healthcare record, we want to bring parts of that, the shelter data, individuals who's gone through shelters, we want to take that and help refine the algorithm with it so we can create better insights and be more timely and also scale this into some sort of potentially surveillance system where we can have predictors of individuals who might be homeless or might become homeless and then be able to provide them better services um, because of it. So this is a, a long project and it gets pretty complicated in some respects. Uh, our machine learning individuals, especially Dan Lazada are gonna be key in this, but we have some really great ideas and things that we can build on. And we're just cusping on the elements of putting this prototype together. So I'll stop there and I'll happy to answer any questions on the, uh, on the chat form should they come up. So we're moving now to Craig Cooper, who is the Director of Housing Stability Services, uh, Social and Health Development with the City of London. And I must thank the City of the Lon London has been a partner for over two decades with our research. And we, uh, we couldn't do this kind of research without your assistance. So thank you, Craig. Thanks, Cheryl, and, and good morning, everyone. I'm um, going to talk really briefly uh, about London's experience in, in data uh, and how we're using that uh, data today to help try and solve and end homelessness in the City of London. So traditionally, uh, or I should say historically, the City of London um, worked with our, our service providers and, and collected data through an Excel template, basically. Every provider carried and collected their own data. Um, provided uh, unique identifiers for individuals on their own database and really um, really saw significant challenges with data quality, duplication. You really could never get that, that total number of individuals seeking service in the community because people were moving from shelter to shelter, service provider to service provider on a daily or even a weekly basis. So um, in early late 2017 or early 2018, the city of London uh, signed on to be uh, utilized the HIFAS database, which is the Homeless Information and Family Information System, HIFAS for short. And from there, uh, our data collection has really, um, really started to pick up pace and, and really uh, get more clear and accurate. Um, what we've been able to do is have a consistent platform uh, where all of our funded agencies are now inputting data. Uh, it allows us to understand uh, any duplicates, uh, remove those duplicates, and get a better, real, a real better picture of who is accessing our system. Uh, as Cheryl mentioned, and I know the, the purpose of the project was to try and understand total homelessness in, in Canada and, and, and specifically what we look at in London, um, it's, it's still a difficult question, right? Because the unsheltered individuals uh, that we see and that you've mentioned uh, every day, they don't touch the system as often as, uh, as some other individuals do. And generally, they may not touch your traditional shelter service system due to various you know, uh, barrier reasons. And so um, the City of London actually is trying to improve our data quality on the field and in, in, in uh, working with unsheltered individuals <clears throat> through our, our outreach program. Uh, we have uh, two teams that work 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, in known areas where, where we uh, work with unsheltered individuals, uh, as well as through our coordinated and informed response program. So uh, members of the public, when they see an individual um, experiencing unsheltered homelessness, whether it's in an encampment or in a sleeping rough, uh, they're able to contact the city. Uh, we use a geographic information system through our data management software to pinpoint that individual is on a latitude and longitude um, quadrant and are able to send our outreach teams out to engage with those individuals. So it's really, really significantly improved our data quality uh, and, and our understanding of the unsheltered population in the city. Um, the big thing about IFIS is, is it's also a reporting uh, tool. So we're able to run reports on the data that we have. Uh, we're able to really understand the dynamics uh, of, of our community. Um, and it's really led to significant in improving in our data quality around indigenous populations, around our veterans populations, uh, as well as our unsheltered and our chronic homeless populations. And so a prime example 
Um, the city of London was the first uh, community in Canada to achieve functional zero for veterans homelessness. So um, it's a great uh, achievement by the city and in all of our partners, but wouldn't have been able to happen had we not known uh, the number of veterans we were trying to serve. And uh, we recognize that veterans are very mobile in our community. We're on the 401 corridor here in Ontario. So, uh, you know, veterans are able to move up and down from Windsor to Ottawa quite regularly. And so as we were able to utilize the data, uh, work with our partners and understand sort of um, uh, veteran situations, we were able to then uh, really start being um, focused on outcomes for those individuals. Uh, we're able to build partnerships with uh, federal agencies that will allow us to quickly confirm veteran status, uh, confirm uh, resources available to veterans, and get them really connected to services quite quickly, which alleviates their homelessness in, in a matter of weeks uh, versus the months to years that we had been seeing traditionally. Uh, another great improvement we've made on our, our data is around our Indigenous homelessness. So London's Indigenous population makes up about 2.7 to 3% um, of, of, of the broader population. But when we look at our Indigenous homeless population at our last point in time count in 2017, uh, that number was almost 30%. And so as we've implemented HIFIS and, and the real-time data uh, that we can input and collect and analyze through that system, we're at about 20% uh, of, of our homeless population is identifying as um, Indigenous. Part of that improvement is not only having that standard platform, but also um, the questions we ask and allowing an individual to self-identify um, as Indigenous and, and answering, um, uh, collecting that data appropriately. So historically we used eight um, Indigenous options when we were asking an individual when they were coming to access service, whether it was shelter, uh, through our outreach programs uh, or any other our city funded programs. And that just seemed to be too, too onerous. Um, our frontline staff were really challenged with getting through all the options with an individual, attention deficit issues, um, really uh, having an individual comfortable answering those questions. So we're able to really whittle down those eight uh, items down to four uh, and focus really just more on whether or not an individual identifies as Indigenous, uh, whether they identify as non-Indigenous, uh, where maybe an agency didn't ask at that point or the person refused the question. So we were able to improve our response rate from about 78%, which is still pretty good, but up to 98% just by changing those options. So that's really allowed us to collect that data in a, a more um, accurate way and, and give us a lot of confidence in the data that we are collecting, that we truly understand sort of our Indigenous population in our community. The other thing that our HIFAS database allows us to do is, is, is um, work on uh, shelter stays, work on interactions with community, uh, understand when people are not engaging our system. So it really allows us then to really talk about when we look at chronic homelessness. And chronic homelessness is defined as anybody who has um, stayed within a, a you know a shelter system uh, more than six months in the last 365 days or uh, has a specific range of episodic homelessness over the last year and a half and certain number of uh, instances of homelessness. So we've been able to really utilize uh, our HIFAS data as well as the work um, that our outreach teams um, are doing, including uh, just sort of the, some of the anecdotal information that we get from our outreach teams. It, it's really um, that allows uh, those teams to really identify the hidden homeless option. It's really not telling the whole picture. Uh, and so this information and allowing our, uh, our funded agencies and our, our outreach teams to, to be able to input that data into HIFAS really allows us to collect a, a more complete picture uh, we see from a chronic unsheltered homeless individual. So uh, we've been able to then uh, take all this, this data. Uh, we've instituted what we call our coordinated access system or a centralized intake type process. And so we use a hybrid centralized intake model. We have uh, an area where the city uh, is the main focus at one of our offices, but then we also have a number of agencies that are able to feed into that system. And so that coordinated access system has really allowed us to match individuals to resources. It's allowed us to prioritize individuals as significant needs in community uh, and then match people to resources. So we're really using data a lot differently than we had been a couple of years ago, and we're seeing great outcomes uh, as evidenced by the Veterans Homeless uh, announcement. Thank you, Craig. And I'm going to pass now uh, back to Courtney, who is going to explain how we're going to handle the question and answer period.
Whoops. Yeah. Hi, everyone. So as we mentioned before, this is going to be a moderated question period um, where everyone can answer or ask their questions using the Q&A chat function found at the bottom of the window. So it should just be in the black toolbar there. And if you could please direct your question appropriately. Um, so for example, this is for Cheryl Horchuk, this is for Craig Cooper, uh, this is for Richard Booth, that sort of thing. It just helps to make sure you're getting the best answer to your question. Okay, thank you very much. So we'll get started then. Mm -hmm. Okay. And while we're waiting for a question, go back one slide, Courtney, and I'll just give some of the highlights and then that's gonna give people, oh, I see one question popping up. Um, just uh, again, what we're hoping to do is to come up with a cost-effective and scalable method to determine who and how many people in Canada are homeless. So we know we do have things such as point in time counts, which uh, take a, a tremendous effort and are not necessarily uh, going to be 100% accurate. I know in many communities that that could be literally hundreds of volunteers, and the volunteers are often people who would otherwise be working with uh, with the homeless sector. I know, um, and uh, it may or may not be accurate. And this idea that we could. Uh, identify trends, see who needs, uh, needs help, but also see what is working. Um, because it's hard to know if you're improving or helping solve a problem if you can't measure the problem itself. Uh, and we hope that that will provide policymakers, uh, researchers and practitioners better insight as to who actually is in the homeless population, which means who needs service uh as uh, as well as when those services are provided are they actually working do they make a difference uh so th that's really um the reason that we're doing what we're doing it's it's not uh, it's not just as an academic exercise to say yes this is the magic number of homeless in the country it's more about so then what uh, what is it we're able to do about it now that we know that uh, and I see we now have a few questions and we'll go back to the slide about how to answer questions. It's, and maybe, uh, Courtney, you could go all the way to the contact slide uh, in case anybody would like to jot down how to get a hold of us. And Courtney, I'll let you moderate those questions. Perfect. Okay, so um, we've got a question for Craig. So are you in contact with Soldiers Helping Soldiers chapter? lead for the Toronto surrounding area. And this is from Claude. Uh, I don't believe they're part of our veterans uh, housing group here in the city of London. Um, we more, our main contact here in the city is the Legion uh, and, and, and the Ontario Legion uh, across an, um, across the community. So um, I'll make a note of uh, of that that organization, uh, and I'll bring it to our next uh, uh, veterans um, community table to have some conversations about engaging them. Thank you. Yeah, uh, and and I'm just going to add because we've done uh, London as well uh, has had a lot of landmark in terms of homeless uh, veterans. We actually did the first study in Canada on homeless veterans, and part of what we did was ask. Um, veterans, not only in London but across the country, how did they become homeless? And again, what services did they access? And one of the things we found is one of the first uh, programs people act uh, uh, contact points once people became homeless was the Legion. Uh, and uh, so, so this is where where over the years, uh, but but some uh, in the years since, a number of new supports have also emerged. Uh, and sometimes it does vary community by by community. Um, but again, it's it, it, I, I just say that as an example of um, research and understanding what services people tend to access can be really important in finding people. Okay, Perfect. back to you, Courtney. Okay, so we've got a question for Richard. I see that he might be typing yeah, an I'm, answer I'm giving, here. Uh, I'm giving the, uh, um, the type. 
type job, but I, I can happily speak to it in a larger way if uh, you want me to respond to Ulysses' comment. Okay, so um, if we have any interest in having a deeper dive into the machine learning and AI aspects of the methods used to predict homelessness and mention the data sources and variety, um, I don't know if you'd like to speak to that a little bit or if you're just gonna write the answer there. I can I can try to uh, respond to it in a larger way. And I'll, I'll be first off to admit that I am not a machine learning or AI researcher by background. I'm a psychiatric mental health nurse by, by background. So um, this will be one of those responses where uh, this will be a formative thing that will be conducted by and assisted with our colleagues on the project. But as a kind of a larger overall, which I didn't get into in the two or three slides that I went through, uh, the machine learning that we'll be using will be an, ex um, an explainable AI approach, which means that we will be able to train the algorithm um, using a data set that we have currently uh, established of individuals who are experiencing homelessness. And we'll be able to feed in new variables that will be probably deterministically linked to these individuals in a, a way, shape or form to help re refine the actual algorithm itself. Because right now it's very healthcare administrative data saturated actually almost exclusively. So we're missing sociological data, we're missing shelter data, we're missing a lot of financial data. We're missing pretty much everything outside of someone touching a healthcare system, which is a weakness into the algorithm itself, but that's how it was created because we kind of needed to start somewhere. So the machine learning angles of it, I'm not gonna get into the specifics because I honestly could not probably speak to them at, at a, a concrete level. I would bring my colleague Dan in to, to really uh, refine that. Uh, but as part of years three and four, that's when we're going to be moving over uh, the data sets that we've collected and refined in years one and two over to the high performance computing systems over at ICS Central, where they have um, banks of supercomputers more or less set up. And we'll probably be using R, uh, the programming language R, to re, um, start creating the machine learning kind of uh, approach and methodologies, uh, which we haven't completely established at this point because we're still actually just refining our data structures. So we're still actually in very traditional data uh, administrative land where we're taking, cleaning, translating variables from a very qualitative sense into something quantitative that then can eventually be machined. So I hope that helps um, as a kind of a, a quick entry, but I'm happy if you'd like to send me a message on email, I can. Uh... Perfect, thank you, Richard. Okay, so this, there's a couple of Ian, here we've got, how do you intend to move from predicting homelessness in communities where you have the data to predict homelessness in Canada with areas such as rural, rural or remote areas where you don't have data? Excellent question. And it was one that um, uh, it, it really speaks to my heart because one of the things I find uh, as a researcher looking at homelessness, most of the research we do is in the large urban centers uh, and context really matters. Um, so, and again, just going to the example uh, with the veteran homelessness situation and I, I mentioned about the legions, uh, we, we worked with the legions, for example, to find out what legions um, had the most requests from homeless veterans. And we found that they were largely uh, in these small rural communities, often, as again, because many times uh, veterans live in the rough, that did not even have a shelter. Um, uh, so, so we did workshops in a number of those, you know, so we were, you know, places like the Paw, uh, was so much Vancouver as Surrey. It wasn't so much um, uh, Halifax as Lower Saxville. Uh, so, so that was important. But we really want to make a point in where we're going in the next uh, in the next year uh, to make sure we go to some of these smaller rural communities we, that we go to communities that don't have a shelter. Uh, or uh, that, that could otherwise be uh, missed. Uh, so when we talk about the communities that we're going to, and we're hoping some of those communities may even be on the call today, we think it's important uh, not to simply go to the large urban centers uh, because that will just end up replicating where we already have data uh, and we're anticipating some of these smaller communities. Uh, we're collecting data in different ways, uh, it may be that at, 
I know for some of our other work that there's also this issue of mobility in terms of people, for example, going to some other spots for some of the services and then returning. Um, but it's the importance of including smaller rural and more remote communities, uh, as well as kind of the low hanging fruit where everybody goes, which is the larger urban centers. And, and I don't know if that it totally answers your question. If, if not, uh, feel free to uh, follow up and Courtney will keep an eye for that. And what was it, that, Courtney, was there part of that you think I missed? Um, I don't think so. Okay. I think all right. you answered it pretty well. <laughs> okay. And then by, by all means, again, uh, the emails there, if, if you need more uh, details, to feel free to email me on it. Perfect. And just along those lines, we've got one from Andrew for you as well. And it mm -hmm. says outside of the Ontario cities that you mentioned, what other communities do you plan on consulting? Yes. Well, if anyone's from other places, feel free to drop us a line. When, when, we, um, when we did the proposal, uh, we, we gave examples of communities that we would like to go to. Uh, and, but we, we have, uh, um, we have not, we're just in the, in the process of starting communications with those communities. We would very much like to get up to the territories, for example, and I know some people are there for, from the territories, hopefully in person, if not virtually, virtually isn't really uh, the same. We do want to get to rural communities. So some of the communities we went to during the, when we were doing the homeless veteran workshops, uh, you know, such as the PAW, like uh, communities like that, we would like to get back to. Um, uh, and we want to make sure uh, that we go to both Eastern uh, as well as Western provinces. Uh, we also want to ensure that we have, and you'll see the French team. So we currently are, um, and Muriel uh, Dusat leads the, the French team. So we do, we are in the process of setting some things up in Montreal as well as Moncton uh, in terms of um, the Francophone um, focus groups and interviews. And as well, we do have, um, be, we are able to offer those individual interviews uh, in both official languages and any of the communities that we go to. Uh, so that is also uh, important. And, and as I said, we do have the list of people there um, is that uh, if people would like to follow up uh, in French and Harry is on the call today, if you have uh, uh, questions uh, for any of our Francophone um, participants can email Harry today and we can pass that on as well. Um, so again, we're, we're, I, I don't want to name um, communities that we haven't got 100% agreement from that community, uh, but that gives you a, a sense of where we would like to go. And as I said, we, we are hoping that people on the call today will also reach out back to us. We also hope it'll be more than 12 communities um, total. Uh, I, I always take the stance of under promise and over deliver on, the, on these things. So 12 is like our bare minimum. Uh, that we would like to reach, just like we had said we wanted to interview 60 to 70 this year, but indeed interviewed 84. Uh, we would also like to extend um, uh, the, the communities that we are able within our budget to, to uh, include. Thank you, Cheryl. So we've got one. Um, Natalie or Telebrita instead of using spread. Um, and I think that has been a goal of a number of different agencies, and I can't mention them all off the top of my head. But I think in our in our in our background leading up to this project, we sent off a bunch of research assistants, and including ourselves, to kind of search out what types of data. And the ICS uh, Western individuals have been great on this, especially uh, Lucy Richards and uh, um, uh, Selena Sharif. They've they've been instrumental in being able to kind of piece together what is data in individuals experiencing homelessness. And what we've really come to the conclusion is everyone just kind of does whatever they're doing to service their own organization or agency, which is completely fair. So as a larger overall goal of this project is to figure out how we can federate certain things. Now, are we the end all be all? Will we federate it? Absolutely not. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna take the attempt at taking together what is the most important angles that we can um, through 
a lot of heavy lifting because there's a lot of sharing agreements, a lot of data security things, a lot of privacy. There's a couple of comments I've responded to in terms of confidentiality and the surveillance per se of individuals and the future, you know, stigmatization and criminalization of individuals. So we have to be really careful because we can do lots of things, but should we do lots of things? And that, that's the kind of question that comes up. So yes, there's, uh, there's definitely a push of, by a number of organizations and we want to start down that pathway from both an ethical perspective, uh, a privacy, um, strong perspective and something that is client centered and focused, which I think is the main driver of this project. We want to make better services for individuals, but we can't make better services for individuals until we know who they are, where they are, and kind of what they're up to. Um, and that's like, I think the larger thesis of this project is to be able to find people through data because at current point, it's calling up someone asking how many individuals do you have or standing on the street corners and doing point of uh, assessment counts. Like we just don't have a way to quickly enumerate things, which I think is a, a definitely a policy um, uh, uh, barrier that we can hopefully fulfill in some way, shape or form through this project. I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, I would just add to like, we've seen tremendous uh, improvements with HIFAS and, and I know Craig spoke a lot to that, but it, again, when we look at what communities use HIFAS and what, which ones don't, it's again, some of your smaller, more rural communities that often don't use the, those databases. And we don't want a system that builds in the neglect of certain communities and particularly certain size communities. Uh, particularly when we know that hidden homeless is an issue and people who are living in the rough are more likely to, to go to some of those communities and, and then not have access to services. Excellent point. Thank you, Cheryl. So we are coming up to almost 11 o'clock here. Um, and just reviewing the questions. It looks like we've got time to answer one more here, possibly, and then end up with our time. Okay. So um, this question is from Justin and it's for Richard and or Cheryl. So from among the data sources you described earlier in the presentation, are there any which are particularly easy or particularly difficult to incorporate into the national level data set? I think that knowing what data systems would allow us to best participate in this project moving forward would be valuable. Mm -hmm. Richard, you, that sounds like a Richard question. And thank you, Justin. That's a, that's a, that's a huge question. Um, so <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best to, to get it. Good so on my heart. <laughs> data, is, is, data is not the problem. It's getting it to work together, which is, I think, our issue. And it, it's, we have lots of great stuff out there. We have lots of great information. And it's funny, whenever the question disappears as soon as I start talking, so I'm losing track of um, the question. But it, it's one of those things where data is not so much of our issue. We really need to take a step back and uh, think about the different ways we can internalize what we have and then start to work together to uh, be able to use it to generate um, different insights. So is there particularly easy ways or difficult ways to incorporate national level data sets? There's lots of data sitting at the at StatsCan and, and Chi high level, which we're actually using. Um, and we're going to do a basic uh, RDC slash Chi high run to run this algorithm nationally to give us some, some population uh, representative across Canada. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think I can, in the remaining minute or so, describe <laughs> the... The difference of insights to really figure out what the low hanging fruit are and things that we can potentially address and then start to work for them. Because we, we've been working with individuals from even Alberta, but then we run into the oh, we can't do this because of the policy, the legislation, the data is not congruent. And this is not magic. Like we have to do a lot of the data cleaning before the stuff will even play together. So th there's lots of barriers, but they're not barriers. So it's not the data, it's making it all work together. So I wish I could be more descriptive than that, but it's, I think it's definitely a program of research and, and definitely a policy direction that we can move forward into the future. And there's lots of work in this domain. So we're happy for help and suggestions. Perfect, thank you, Richard. And thank you, Justin, for that question. I know it's a bit of an onerous one to get through. And just a reminder, we have our contact information up on the slides here. So if you have any questions that we don't get to or that you think of later, please do feel free to reach out 
to anyone that are, is listed here. I know that everyone is um, super interested in getting to know um, any feedback or ideas that anyone has. So, yeah. Um, and as that? well, um, we are particularly interested in contacting the communities that we will be uh, including in the next phase. Uh, some of you may get an email from us. Some of us, you may be emailing us and we are very happy to do that. And, and ultimately, um, the, the goal is to, to really address homelessness uh, in Canada. Uh, that that it is a it is it is a problem that we simply need more data and we we know from some of the progress we've been able to um, to make. I, I, when I start working in, in the field, um, because I've been around around a while, we did not always have this huge of a homeless problem. It very much relates to pol to policy. So I I do see it as a solvable problem. Uh, and I think with data, we can make great, great strides uh, in, in this area. So that, that's my hope uh, and optimism. Uh, you can also uh, contact um, Laura in terms of any media present. We do have a, a few media things uh, already set up. Uh, so Laura Con Concaves, uh, you see there, please contact. Uh, and as I'll as mentioned, uh, this is has been streaming live on Facebook for Lawson Health Institute Research. It will be available at that site after. So if some of you think, gee, I wish someone else in the community or that I work with could also have uh, been with us today, you can go to that Lawson Facebook page and see the video after. Uh, and on that video, again, you will see our contact information and they see the contact information uh, and we can continue this conversation. So thank you all for joining today.